we are here to uncover the good, the bad, and the ugly of the IT industry. My name is Robin Johns, and this is Convergence by Cato Networks. The tools, systems, and devices we use to work, communicate, and manage our day-to-day -day activities have made life more comfortable for almost everyone. Our digital transformation was meant to blur the lines of race, gender, age, and ability. But technology has more work to do to become truly inclusive, especially when considering the issue of accessible technology for those with disabilities. Our guest today is Jeff Aronow, Cato Network Support Operations Manager. Jeff is from the US and has worked in the tech industry for over 25 years. He was born with a condition called ocular albinism, which in the States rendered him legally blind. Upon moving to the UK, he was upgraded to sight impaired. With a visual acuity of 20 to 200, or 6 out of 60, if you're into the whole metric thing, we've asked Jeff to join us today to talk about his view on accessibility in the tech industry. So let's get started. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Robin. Thanks for having me. Before we get started and jump into the meat of the content, tell me, how did you get to where you are today in your career? A lot of practice and hard work. Luck. So basically, I have to say I started in tech support because I had a friend that found a job in Chicago. And so I went and uh, joined them. Chicago is a great city for me because it has good public transit so I could get around despite my vision. And then, uh, yeah, it sort of just built on things from there. Ended up in the D.C. area, then ended up in Boston, got a job back in tech support for Juniper Networks, moved to the U.K. working for Riverbed. And one of my colleagues on Riverbed had just started working for this crazy startup called Cato Networks, and uh, he suckered me in, and here I am. I worked as a tier three support engineer for a while, but I, I can't help but uh, get involved and stick my nose into more things, and now I'm the support operations manager. Curiosity is one of the most important traits in technology. The more curious they are, the more nosy you may be, the more you learn, the more you develop and grow. So for the learners out there and people listening, the big question that we're trying to answer today is regarding accessibility and technology. So to just preface and set the landscape, what is accessibility to you? Uh, so accessibility is the ability for apps, devices, whatever you're interfacing with to be used by people that maybe don't have 20-20 vision, that maybe are hearing impaired, people that aren't able to use all the controls because they don't have 10 fingers. It's the ability for the technology to be flexible enough to be used by other people that may be differently abled. Okay, so is this a legal requirement currently in the UK and the States? Because it seems like everybody needs accessibility, but is it enforced? I only speak to this, I have to say I'm not a legal expert, I'm not a space lawyer or anything like that. I just come from my own experience. So I, I understand a little bit of the laws in the States, a little bit of laws in the UK. In the States, if you do anything with like the federal government, there's certain rules and guidelines that you're supposed to comply with. You're supposed to make it blind accessible. You're supposed to have a little accessible button in like the corner of your app. Not everybody does that. Not everybody complies with all, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, not everybody complies with every regulation that's out there. Some people are better than others. And you can really see this, like most people today are, are very conscious of making their apps work, their web apps work in either desktop browser or very specifically focused on a mobile browser. And in doing so, they definitely don't always make it accessible unless they're part of some federal contract. It's not like there's some court I can take them to to get them to provide the information in a different format. Similar in the UK, I've noticed the UK is even, it just has different standards. I don't want to say they're less necessarily than America. It's just America focuses you know, on some stuff over here and the UK focuses on some stuff over here. So I have noticed like the gov.uk, which is one of the major, for, for people that aren't familiar with the UK, it's one of the major government websites. And we're talking like at the national level and at the regional level, there's a lot of information on gov.uk. They always do things. They have very specific standards that they write stuff to. And they do try to be a bit more accessible, friendly than say, even something like Facebook. And so there is there is a sense, I think, from those different groups of trying to make things accessible. But I've not seen any lawsuits because somebody couldn't read a website. Let's just say that. Okay. So getting into technology must have been a little difficult for you because a lot of what we do every day is quite visual. 
So did you notice any barriers to entry when applying for jobs? Because most people would see somebody who's legally blind and think that they may struggle with doing a tech job. I know Slack is quite difficult to use if you're legally blind. When I got into the tech industry way back in the day, um, you know, it was like 25 <laughs> years ago, right? We're talking the, the late 90s. So there was no Slack. Well, there was IRC, but nobody had made it into Slack yet. And we're back in the days of like, you know, mobile phones that, you know, the most advanced thing they had on it was the game Snake, where you had like the little dot that moved around and you had to like collect other little dots. Did I have a problem then? A bit, but I have, I have actual things that are, it's an advantage or a disadvantage. So my disability, I can see, right? I can see stuff. I can usually see people's faces to interact with them and identify who they are. But so what I call my disability is sort of like an invisible disability, unless I've told you or uh, in the UK, they have these great little things that you can wear around your neck to, to sort of signal people like a little lanyard type thing that you have an invisible disability. Most people don't recognize that I have a disability until they see me using my computer screen and I use my screen and I'm about this far away from it. Same thing with my phone. I'll, I'll look really, really close on my phone. Uh, so 20 years ago, though, you didn't have any of that. So what I would get is, um, you know, I get through the interview because technically I knew everything I was talking about. and then. You know, if I needed a bigger monitor or needed a magnifying lamp or something for any of the work I was doing, I can't say I've ever had pushback, but I have absolutely had to act as my own champion. I'd have to say, hey, I'm legally blind. I need a bigger monitor. And pretty much everybody just leaves it at that. I think everybody was too scared that there might be a lawsuit or anything like that. So, so most people are like, okay, here, have a big monitor. Why does Jeff get a big monitor? He's blind. Shut up. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's always benefited me. The, the great thing about technology, right, is that it's always advancing. And there was a horrible dark age for me where LCDs became very popular, but you didn't have all of the wonderful like scaling and the different um, built into the operating system effects and tools uh, that you have today. So for the longest, longest time, I stuck with two giant and very, very heavy CRT monitors to do all of my work because CRT was the only way I could reduce the resolution and yet have it run natively at that resolution rather than, you know, with all the pixel doubling and the horribleness that would happen if you tried to run an LCD monitor at anything but its native resolution. So for a long time, I struggled. I, I remember late in the 90s, early 2000s, I was working exclusively on a laptop. And I mean, I was hunched over with like a, you know, nine, 10 inch screen as were the, the standard at the time. And I, I got things done, but it was, uh, it was not good on my back. I'm very lucky that I was young. So you were adopting the full prawn stance for most of the 90s, just being hunched over the laptop. Yes, uh, giving myself future back problems, which, you know, all young people do, right? You just you waste your youth trying to push everything to extremes. And then you get old and you're like, ow, all that hurts now. It was a bit like that. But, you know, you, you make do, right? That's a very British value is uh, you make do and, and you get through. And I was able to do that, fortunately. But... You know, I'm very, very happy that in today's modern times, I have two LCD monitors that are on monitor arms that come out way over my desk. Uh, so I can sit very close to the screens, you know, Macs and PCs both. I can remember it was like in Windows 7, I think, where I first saw that you could increase the scaling to like 150%. And when you did it, it made everything bigger, but it wasn't, it wasn't horrible. You know, even today, there's some web apps, if you increase the, the zoom in the web app, and trust me, I'm very familiar with the, you know, holding the control or the command keys and the plus and minus to make my websites bigger or smaller. It used to be when you did that, that characters would go all over the screen. And every now and then you'll get to a website that's not set up for much accessibility. And when you do those increases, things will shift columns and now nothing makes sense because the table's all screwed up. But yeah, it was still an amazing revolution for me to have, have that setting in Windows and then you know on the Mac like you can adjust the size of the screen and, and everything that scales and that it, it not only scaled, but it worked, right? I could actually read it and it was usable. So technology has definitely gotten better over the years. One of my favorite features on Android smartphone, it's so minuscule, nobody even noticed it. You put in an Android smartphone on a web page, you could zoom into the page and if you double tapped, it like reformatted the entire text to fit the width that you just set. So I could zoom in, double tap, boom. On the iPhone, it's the reader view. And there's, there's still some websites today that won't let you go to reader because they want you to see it in their format and not exclude any of the ads they're trying to pop you up. 
but you know both of those features were were accessible features that were huge for me because they made it so that even in a small form factor i could increase the text size to to something that was usable that read of view is useful not just for accessibility but for getting content quick i use it myself uh, we go to a website, click that button, and you just remove all of the shiny, shiny marketing elements and just get to the actual core of the subject, which is great. So, Jeff, if you were to be sat in a room with the world's head developers of every single application, imagine some council like this exists, what would you tell them that needs to change? What user experience things should they keep in mind? What do they need to improve to make technology more generally accessible or friendly to somebody with visual or physical disabilities? The key is probably user testing. I know that in my company, there are certain individuals that often call on me to look at stuff and go, can you read that? And I go, no. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we'll play around with Zooms and see if we can make it a little bit easier to identify. But I mean, the same thing is true for people with like physical disabilities. You know, are, are people going to be able to use the keyboard shortcuts and things like that if they need to, if they have uh, hearing disabilities? Are there things on your site, you know, that can change color and things like that for signals? It's really about user testing. And I think that the vision one, okay, I mean, clearly that's my problem. So it's the one I can speak to most directly. I feel like as the boomers get older and their vision gets worse and worse, I really feel like I'm waiting for the revolution to happen and for everybody to realize, huh, we can't use like two point font on our, on our mobile web pages anymore because not only can the people that are disabled not read it, but most of the older generation can't actually read it either because the print is just too small. So I'm waiting for that. But yeah, I, I would say it's, it's, it's about user testing. It's about having somebody you trust. And it may be that if you just look around, you know, one of the things I think is probably pretty common amongst people with disabilities is we don't like to be thought of as any different. And so, you know, especially in Zoom world nowadays, right, where you're not in the office, you're not interacting with people on a day-to-day -day basis, you may actually have people in your company that could do all of this testing for you, right? They're all working. You'd have no idea. A lot of people don't have any idea until they see me in person actually using my phone or using my laptop and go, oh, gosh, I get it now. You, you actually, you really do have a vision problem. So, you know, there might be people in your company that you could actually reach out to that could help with a lot of these things. And most of the time, I don't think anybody finds it onerous tasks to undertake. It's just a matter of just a little bit of effort to, to get that feedback, right? I know Cato has a UI expert. A lot of companies are hiring more and investing in, in UI experts. And I think you know, if you just did that little bit of extra testing, you'd be able to apply and appeal to, to a, a much broader segment of the population. So imagine you're a company that doesn't have anybody with visual or physical disabilities or impairments. Who would you advise that they reach out to to form an accessibility committee? Uh, their grandparents. Their grandparents. <laughs> I have one company, when I worked at uh, Juniper, one of the development managers had the, had the theory, you know, can my grandfather use it, right? That was his testing paradigm was to say, okay, you know, this UI is my grandfather going to be able to sit in front of it and do stuff with it and make it work? It's a funny thing, but in, in different countries, right? So in the UK, there's like a society for the blind where they're doing lots of, um, they're basically like a volunteer or a, a charity organization that runs and offers lots of resources for people that are visually disabled. They have one in each county in the UK. You could reach out to places like that. In the States, there are definitely commissions for the blind. I find that the states, you know, especially with the privacy thing, they're a little bit more hesitant about volunteering people. It's not the easiest thing to say, hey, uh, can I get, uh, you know, my token blind person to, uh, to review this? Um, but, um, you know, maybe forums, maybe internet forums to see if, uh, if you have people that want to participate. I generally find that people that are disabled really don't mind helping out in this regard if you can get to them and ask them, because the, the whole thing is, is, hey, could I make it easier for you to use this thing? Oh, gee, twist my arm to get my feedback on that, right? So yeah, absolutely. I, I think if you, you could try internet forums, you could try uh, reaching out to some of the volunteer organizations that are available in your country or your region, um, and they might be able to hook you up with people. So if you were to give, say, three or five tips to interface designers on how to make things more accessible, what would you advise them to do? I think it's got to be flexible. The interface has to be flexible to be adjusted for different resolutions for different people. 
everybody's got their own requirements. You obviously should avoid any of the colors that are like colorblind stuff. One of the feedbacks that I gave early on to the Cato product was the colors that we were using on our graphs were not necessarily distinguishable from each other. So you, you want to make sure that, you know, okay, technically this color number might be very far from this color number, but you know, if you're blue green colorblind or whatever, or blue green red colorblind, maybe you're not going to be able to distinguish between those two. So flexible using very good distinguishing colors. I would also say don't rely on small elements to do things, right? And you can make it look nice without having to make the buttons huge and stupid, but make it so that the things are distinguished from each other and are pretty functional. The dark mode, ridiculously or not, the dark mode can be a huge actual benefit, not just a nice shiny, shiny feature because it's got a better contrast. Some people see a better contrast with with a dark background, some people see better with a dark with a light back, you know. So even having the dark mode, a lot of the reason I use the dark mode is just because I find with the black background and the white text, it's got a better contrast. It's much easier for me to see, read, and interact with. That's great. I mainly use dark mode because I'm I often end up being up until the late hours of the night, staring at white pixels, and then I can't get to sleep afterwards. So dark mode kind of relaxes and eases in. So that's great. So you're telling us that we need to be more flexible, we need to be more inclusive aware and generally designing for people who may struggle. Is that right? I think it's more of awareness, right? There's not a revolution in color design. It's just, hey, be aware that you really shouldn't contrast red and green because there are people out there that are red, green, colorblind. So just by just having even like a list of best practices, you can easily make it so that it works for a lot more than just the normal set of people, we'll say. So from your experience, where do you see the future of accessibility going in the realms of technology? As more vendors are now offering things like augmented reality, virtual reality, which doesn't really cater to those with visual accessibility needs. I always laugh at sci-fi. I like a lot of sci-fi. You know, they've got, they've got people with contacts on and they've got these displays in their eyes, you know, and when Google Glass came out, I thought, oh, well, that's cool, but I would never be able to use that because the text is just going to be way too tiny. There's, it's not going to be usable by me. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested to see like on the, on the VR goggles, you know, one of the things that VR goggles count on is that you have a certain amount of field of view, uh, which not everybody does, that basically they're expecting it to be out to a certain distance, right? It's all configured as though everybody can see the same at a certain distance. And that's also not true. So, you know, I, I have seen things. One of the interesting things was to see Google Glass adopt early on, and again, it's a sort of a failed experiment, but it was interesting to see them acquiesce to the fact that they would allow you to bring your prescription, right? And you could order and get different prescription glasses. I see it not so much being necessarily on the software side of things, but I see it being more on the hardware side as people realize, hey, you know, we need to cater to a lot of people wear glasses. And so we need to cater to these things. And the, the advances in uh, manufacturing allow for that flexibility, right? So I, I see, that's where I really see a lot of the innovation in the industry, um, in the fact that the manufacturing has advanced to allow us to do those individual things at a, at a level that's not ridiculously overpriced over the, the mass produced item. And so it allows for greater flexibility in that sense. Yes, the accessibility and quantity of scale generally goes alongside. I remember about 20 years ago, I was purchased a vibrating pillow to wake me up in the morning because I just didn't hear the alarms in the morning. And that was several hundred pounds. But now you can pick them up for 10 to, to 20 because the mass market has moved forward. People have adopted to it and it's become normalized. So hopefully we can see the same happening with the future of technology innovations with augmented reality catering to everybody instead of just the select few. So Jeff, we have one final question to ask you today before we depart. And that is, what do you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career? Um, what do I know now that I wish I knew at the beginning of my career? It's an interesting question. I wish that I had, uh, had spent more time doing development at the beginning of my career. It's one of the things that I sort of personally shied away from because of all the screen time that was involved. If you remember, you used to have to get things in physical books, right? And it was very difficult for me to read the books, because books are very, uh, obviously a fixed font size, 
and so reading for any period of time could cause a lot of eye strain. So I didn't do as much programming in the beginning uh, that I wish I had done. And if I had done, I could probably be more in development. And just knowing that the trends would continue to adapt, right? So that I can have two monitors, I can have them very close to me, I can do remote work. You know, knowing that those things would be possible, I probably would have gone in a, in a slightly different direction, but I went in the direction I did because I could do it. My, my vision uh, wasn't a hamper to me achieving what I needed to achieve. And yeah, I like it. I, it is fun to do troubleshooting and support. So I'm not like miserable. I'm not like, oh, I wish I, I, I wish I'd done that. Ah, sure. I wish I'd done more development because I, I now see that it could very much have fit where things are today, both from an accessibility standpoint and from a, a usability standpoint for myself. But I still ended up pretty well, I think. I'm pretty happy with uh, with what I do. It is a lot of fun to do tech support. And the thing I always encourage people, I've met other parents that have children that have vision disabilities, and I try to give them hope by saying, listen, I'm legally blind, but I've traveled the world. I've been to China and Taiwan and India and, and you know, gone everywhere for business, uh, been to most of the 50 states traveling for work. You just take cabs, you know, you find ways to adapt. So I really try to encourage people, and empower people in that way to say, you can do it. It's just a matter of, of putting your mind to it. Sure, you're not going to be an astronaut. You're not going to fly airplanes. And that is sad, but it doesn't have to be as limiting as, uh, as you make it out to be. You're not flying planes yet. Self-flying planes will be here a few years after self-flying cars, and then the pilot industry will be in turmoil. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today, Jeff. I appreciate it, and thank you for sharing your experiences with our listeners. Thanks, Robin. That was all for our episode today. I hope you've come away feeling a little more educated and empowered. In case you've forgotten, I'm Robin Johns, and you've been listening to Convergence by Cato Networks. Don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.